Uh, hi, I'm Beth Moorfield, an editor at Nature's Structural and Molecular Biology, and I'm speaking with Leonid Mirny from MIT, whose group has been elucidating the 3D organization of the genome using a combination of biophysical approaches to determine the dynamic properties of chromatin fibers that uh, govern their folding and interactions, as well as high-C approaches to probe their structures and organization within the cell. And I thought, by way of introduction, maybe we could talk about how uh, the polymer models are actually helping to inform uh, genome structure. Thank you. Uh, so basically, thinking about sort of modeling in general and sort of the role of modeling in, in uh, chromosome biology, uh, I would kind of say that if you look at old kind of old school papers, first there are lots of experiments and then there is like figure four, which says, okay, we believe that's how it, it's happening. For us, this is figure one. So the hypothesis of how it may happen is, is the starting point for our modeling. And we use high C and in some cases imaging data to essentially validate what comes out of the models. So we're not really building models based on high C, but we're using all sorts of experimental data to test and to find parameters where the model works. But the starting point is usually a hypothesis, which may be something that has been published or maybe our own hypothesis or sort of something that we, kind of our thinking of how things may work. And then we test this by putting this in the, in the simulation box, saying, okay, for example, polymers should be of this length and we consider this system with this type of, type of interactions. Can this actually give rise to something that's observed experimentally? So that's the overall framework. So it's basically then just, just defining the parameters that then limit or constrict their movements or interactions? For example, parameters that control how different elements of simulations interact, or in some cases, these are parameters of the actual underlying chromatin fiber. For example, diameter of the fiber, flexibility of the fiber, density of different fibers in the volume that we can simulate. We cannot simulate the whole nucleus. We usually simulate like a small volume where a few chromosomes or chromosomal regions interact. And then, uh, so these are physical parameters, plus we add some biological interactions. For, we say, what if euchromatin is attracted to other euchromatic regions? Uh, okay, let's see what's going to, and heterochromatin is not attracted to other heterochromatic regions. What's going to happen? And we run simulations forward and we see what, what happens. And then compare, and then for example, if we want to compare with high C data, we compute frequencies of interactions between different regions. So this gives us simulated high C map that we can then compare to the real high C map. Uh, and we, if we see some disagreement, we say, okay, let's just change parameters of the model. And we usually sweep through a broad range of parameters of the model and see where it agrees with high C data. And in most of the cases, it does not. We say, okay, we need to go back and say, and to revisit the assumptions of the model. And maybe it's actually heterochromatin that needs to interact with heterochromatin, or we need to add laminar interactions. I'm just kind of giving examples of what we're doing. So that's, that's the, that's the, Approach. And the approach actually has been revealing another different levels of organization, but then also this kind of reciprocal influence of chromatin fiber activity and structure. Right, right. So, so, so I think, I think the, the, the main result that we have in, in recent years, or the main hypothesis is that beyond just various interactions, we see that active processes are shaping genome structure. And so that's this hypothesis of loop extrusion where uh, we're saying that not only pairwise interactions between, between different regions, but also activity of a molecular motor should be shaping chromatin. And that, that would allow to create chromosomal domains that may facilitate enhancer promoter interactions. Um, but this requires a motor that nobody have actually observed. So that's why it's a hypothesis. Uh, now we took this hypothesis to the level of saying, okay, this, we believe that cohesin and other SMC proteins perform this particular mechanical function of being a molecular motor that creates this loops, extrudes loops. Uh, but that's again, that's as far as the theory can go without, without being tested experimentally. And sort of that's, that's where we were lucky to again, establish collaborations with, with several labs that started testing uh, this kind of testing this, this model and just testing general kind of biological uh, roles of different components uh, of loop extrusion, ex components of the loop extrusion machinery, but also components general of kind of uh, proteins that play a role in, in shaping chromatin architecture. So you find that these two parameters are actually kind of universal features of the organization of genomes, regardless of cell type or species or 
I, I wouldn't go as far as sort of different species, but sort of certainly we see signatures of loop extrusion in, in bacteria, and perhaps the most direct evidence of this mechanism actually comes from the works of David Rudner in, in, in Bacillus, uh, and also works of Mike Laub in, in Calabacta. Uh, but sort of, uh, we're, we're mostly focusing on mammalian systems and then kind of looking, looking for similar situations in, in, in other organisms, like we looked recently at Cerevisia, where we've actually seen that during interface in, in Baker's yeast, there is, there is no need for loop extrusion to explain high C data. So that's, that's as far as we can go again, as, as far as modelers, we can say what, what, what's needed and what's not needed to reproduce the data. Uh, so Occam's razor kind of uh, logic would tell us, okay, if you don't need it, it doesn't exist, but you know, it's biology, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, in terms of, in, in terms of uh, the, the size of the genome or the way it's part, uh, the size of the genome, of course, is going to affect how it's going right. to be packaged and, and, and accessed. Right. right. So do you find that there is a strong relationship between the size of the individual? It, it looks like, for example, sort of in, it's, it's the size and the, and the sizes of nuclei that certainly play a role and, um, in, in, in shaping chromosomal organization. And we certainly see kind of others and us have seen that in Cerevisia, you can explain imaging and high C data by just assuming that chromosomal arms are freely floating. They're attached to, this, to the spindle pole body, but otherwise are just freely free pol random walk polymers. Um, and these polymers are just kind of free to, free to explore this volume, with, with some exceptions. Um, uh, whereas in mammalian genomes, chromosomes are incredibly long, and the volumes are not enough to allow them to be open uh, polymers. So that's certainly, that is certainly reflected in high C data. So that's something that we can see in practically high C data and in imaging, certainly. Um, However, we notice that in larger, in, in cells with larger nuclei, for example, the oocytes, mm -hmm. uh, some of the physical characteristics of chromosomes would argue that they're much more open and um, can explore volume almost as good as, as free polymers in Cerevisia. So we, we just published this work. It's a single nuclear high C collaboration with Kiku Tachibana Kanvalski in Vienna. Mm -hmm. uh, it came out in Nature a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. I think. And so that's, that was one of interesting uh, kind of insights from the physics point of view that sort of when nuclei become much larger, chromosomes certainly change their, their shape and organization. Uh, but, they, but they do need loop extrusion because we do see a formation of topological associated domains there. Okay. So, so, it's not, so they're not really yeast chromosomes, right? Okay, so these are still yeah. maintained as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, also to always test the predictions of the, the physical models, it requires a lot of matching to the high C data itself, which requires a lot of communication. So what has right. been something that's actually helped to advance that kind of communication between the theoretical and the practical sides of these investigations? Uh, I think I think what really helped us is that we're not only modeling, we're not only developing models, but we actually analyze high C data from point zero, essentially from fast Q files that come out of the sequencing machine. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we decided to invest kind of a lot of efforts in actually developing tools for analysis of, for processing high C data, for correcting various biases in high C data processing, and this way we actually get firsthand experience with what's, what's in the data, and also kind of make sure that we're analyzing real signal rather than various artifacts that may have crawled into the, into the data processing pipeline. So we developed these tools and now, and that also helps our communication with experimental colleagues because essentially we're saying, we've got the data, we can, we can do everything now from this point and sort of constantly exchange ideas, brainstorm together. Because again, our approach, as I, as I said, starts with, with a hypothesis. So that's something where we certainly need input from our bio colleagues on the, on the biology side closer to this particular biological system. And if I, I don't want to overgeneralize kind of from the physics perspective, all chromosomes are like this, all chromosomes are like that, because I understand that in different biological systems, rules of the game can be very different. Um, and that's what we're learning from our colleagues. And sort of, I, I, I'm very grateful to all the people who worked with us and sort of were patient with us kind of developing models and sort of processing data slowly, trying to kind of get the intuition what's going on. Uh, 
Yeah. It is mutually informative. So what would you say then is like one of the, was some of the biggest advances to, to, to driving this field forward there in terms of really working on the 3D genome organization? I think so. Surprisingly enough, in my mind, sort of the biggest advance in this field has been uh, the progress in, in using archives in, for publication. BioArchive and, and other archives have really facilitated kind of the, uh, the pace at which things are being done. Uh, and now everything kind of, everything is on BioArchive practically. Mm -hmm. And I know from our own experience that it takes us year, a year to publish a paper. It can be easily six months or a year, in some cases longer than that. And it's really kind of unfortunate when you go to a conference and somebody tells you about something exciting, but it takes, it takes like a year to see this paper published. Uh, and now everything goes into BioArchive and sort of practically we are, as a field, as a group, we are practically kind of a year, if not more than a year, kind of moving uh, ahead, of, ahead of other fields that do not use BioArchive, yeah. I would say, other fields of biology. And for physics and mathematics, right. it, it's been, you know, they've been using Archive for 20 years. Um, I think it does change also uh, the level of interactions between people because things, it might, I don't know, the field might be kind of less competitive in the negative connotation of competition. Mm -hmm. And if people are, okay, we're going to post this on BioArchive, everybody's going to see it, we're going to get some feedback. I think it, will, it also improves the quality of publications mm -hmm. because you get additional feedback from non-anonymous mm -hmm. uh, colleagues who can suggest something, who can... Uh, be critical or praise your work, so you kind of, you get, you already get a sense of where you stand relative to other public um, contributions in the field kind of early on in the publication process. Mm -hmm. So on the long run, I think, on the long run, I think it, it will accelerate other fields of biology because they'll have to, they'll have to catch up. If, if they depend on chromosome biology, yeah. kind of, they, mm -hmm. wa they wouldn't want to be a year behind, so they will also start posting on bioarchive. We get another view of the critical. I think it's another another voice to critically evaluate the data right? <laughs> from this expertise is invaluable, really. Right. So well, the data is not is not there yet. So so mm -hmm. as far as the release of the data, so again mm -hmm. we're working on the on the data release policy for the for the nucleon consortium, mm -hmm. also trying to accelerate data release. Mm -hmm. Because at this point, it's by archive only contains publications. Right. People usually uh, keep their data uh, private until until the date of the publication. But in principle, there is no reason. Why shouldn't everybody kind of release their data right mm -hmm. away when they post a bioarchive paper? You don't want to be the first one to do this. Yes, of course. <laughs> so, so that's that's the, that's what happened with the bioarchive. Essentially, you didn't want to be the first one to post your paper because then you're in disadvantage. If everybody, almost everybody, is posting, you don't want to hold on to your paper and not post it. So, mm -hmm. you would want to catch up with everybody else. So, there is like a critical transition, mm -hmm. and I hope that with the data release, the same will happen in the next. I think here, maybe a couple of years, that as people will start posting their data publicly, people who do not do this will be, be, will be left behind. Yeah. So it's kind of peer pressure. <laughs> well, we'll be looking forward to it. Okay, well, thanks for yeah. taking time to yeah. speak. Thank you.